Welcome to Practical Tactical, and today we're taking a look at the Bushmaster ACR DMR. ACR is the acronym for Adaptive Combat Rifle. DMR is the acronym for Designated Marksman Rifle. With a name like that, I'll be expecting great things as we move into range testing with this rifle. As I move forward with this review, I'm going to speak quite frankly as a rifle of this price point better impress. I'm going to be brutally honest, so if you're a fanboy, hold on to your hat. There's just so much to talk about with this rifle that I cannot put it all into one video, so this will be a multi-part series. To help viewers follow along, each video will be named the same, but with a suffix to indicate the part number. Bushmaster ACR DMR Review Part 1, Bushmaster ACR DMR Review Part 2, etc. So let's begin by taking a look at the case. As you can see, the rifle comes in a hard case from Bushmaster. There's nothing remarkable about the case as the quality is typical of the most economical hard case options. One point of note is the case itself. It's huge, and as we look inside the case we can see why. This rifle is very tall, and by the time we add a scope to it, the vertical height without a mag will be around 10.5 inches, so it will not fit in many of the more affordable gun cases. So with that in mind, I'm pleased Bushmaster provided the case to keep us from scrambling around to find one that fits. The rifle comes with a trigger lock and an operation manual that you probably won't bother to read, but you might while waiting to get your tires changed. I was surprised to find a chamber flag included, which will come in handy at the range. Let's clear this stuff out of the way and take a look at the rifle. The first thing you'll notice about the rifle is the weight. This thing is heavy. The second thing you'll notice is that it's full of sharp edges. I mean seriously, I don't even want to handle it without tactical gloves on. This forehand has got to go. Bushmaster should have at least included plastic rail covers. To cycle the charging handle, you have to grab the charging handle and slide your hand along what amounts to not one, but two cheese graters. Another thing about this handguard is its size. It's huge, like M60 huge. I mean seriously, what are they thinking? This is just a 223 and there's no reason they couldn't have kept this more slim. This forehand would have been much better with screw on rails so we could at least remove them. In this configuration, I have no option other than to replace the enhanced forehand with the plastic version as soon as possible. When I do, I think I'll put this aluminum forehand in the kitchen so we can use it the next time we make pizza. The next thing I'm not impressed with is the AAC flash hider. The US military dropped this style of muzzle device in the early 80s if I'm not mistaken. I would have much preferred that they provided the AAC muzzle brake instead. I'll be replacing this one before long and when I do, I'll do a video on that. The buttstock feels solid and it's adjustable for both length of pull and the height of the cheek rest. Click adjustments are firm and tactile. I have no doubt this will be an effective buttstock for testing the accuracy of the rifle. The pistol grip has a removable compartment that is labeled for two CR123 batteries. The compartment has a replaceable rubber cap that makes the compartment waterproof. The unit appears to be reasonably well made. It's not front page news that guys don't like the low position on the safety because it interferes with the trigger finger when in the firing position. But I would argue that it's not necessarily the position of the safety that's the problem. It's actually the position of your trigger hand which is about an eighth of an inch too high. Since the pistol grip is molded into the lower receiver, the designers of this rifle trapped us out of corrective options, but an interchangeable backstrap would be a nice feature to add. That way material could be added to lower the hand just a little, just enough to clear the safety. A nice Geisley trigger is included in this model. It's a drop in assembly, but it fits loosely in the lower receiver, and it begs for some sort of epoxy bedding to stabilize the assembly from rocking and taking away the crisp break of this well decent trigger. I kept life simple when I fixed this one by adding two or three layers of scotch tape to each side of the trigger block where the ribs mate with the ribs on the lower receiver. This is an inexpensive fix, but effective. If you watch this video clip, you can see what happened the first time I took the forehand off this rifle. I thought it was a little odd how easy it was to get this pin to move at first, as it was much easier than any of the other pins and there was no clear snap as the detent plunger overcame the retention divot in the pin. As you can see here, the pin came all the way out, which allowed the plunger to spring right out. And luckily it hit my hand or I'd have never found it. The spring, however, took a trip around the room, but after a while with a flashlight, I did recover it. But I wasn't thrilled with that experience. Looking at the pin design, I can see what happened here. During assembly at the factory, the assembler did not spin the pin until the plunger engaged the slot. This allowed the pin to be pulled all the way out. In this case the story had a happy ending, but if not, I would not have been thrilled about having a brand new rifle disabled 15 minutes after bringing it home and without firing a shot. Oh hey, check this out. 
If you rest the rifle on the magazine, the magazine actually interferes with the forward movement of the bolt. The rifle isn't fussy about this either because it does it with either the plastic Magpul mags or the steel mil spec mags. None of my AR-15s ever did this. You can see that this is just a slight tolerancing issue that could be addressed easily if the manufacturer makes the effort. But in the meanwhile, this could contribute to misfeeds if you rest the rifle on the magazine while firing. The quick chain barrel system is something that I would gladly substitute for a less convenient but more rigid and reliable system. And it's important to note that I bought this rifle in spite of this feature and not because of it. I find it hard to believe that a quick change barrel system will reliably hold at zero. So who is this rifle for exactly and why would you buy one? Number one reason? Because you're Canadian. This rifle is not restricted in Canada so Canadians can actually hunt with it. It's not a range queen in Canada like the AR-15. This rifle is one of the few unrestricted semi-autos in 223, and the best part is the 1 in 7 barrel twist rate makes the rifle suitable for deer hunting when you're using heavy bullets. Many companies who produce rifles in 223 cowardly shy away from the advantages of a 1 in 7 barrel twist rate because they fear getting publicly criticized for poor accuracy with cheap 55 grain military surplus ammunition by people who fail to appreciate the clear advantage the 1 in 7 has to offer for the 223. The result is that the consumer has been getting cheated out of the most important performance feature you can have with a 223 rifle, and it's the root cause for so many hunters obstinately rejecting the 223 for deer hunting. The reality is that the 1 in 7 barrel twist rate is ideal for shooting heavier bullets in the 69 to 80 grain range. These heavy bullets are accurate with a 1 in 7 twist rate, and surprisingly effective for small to medium sized game. And let's face it, this small cartridge needs all the help it can get, so why cut it off at the knees with a slow barrel twist rate that commits this round to mediocrity? You might be surprised to know the 1 in 7 223 with 80 grain bullets is used with great success in F-Class competition out to 1,000 yards with a 1 half minute bull, and on a calm day it can hold its own against any caliber out there. Out to 600 yards the 1 in 7 223 with 80 grain bullets can hold its own on any given day. The key is to use the right bullets to take advantage of the 1 in 7. Hey, you can always shoot lighter bullets if you want, and the accuracy may not be the greatest with Milsurp ammo, but when the long shot comes along, or when you want to drop a deer or antelope with your 223, don't be afraid to pull out the heavy bullets and get to work with the 1 in 7. This rifle is a shining example of a company making a diligent effort to produce a rifle to satisfy consumer complaints about other rifles particularly in reference to the AR-15. Well, I have to say, be careful what you ask for, because you just might get it. The problem is that consumers want it all. They just don't understand the fine line that old school designers walked, and the heavily weighed compromises that were made to bring us many of our favorite rifles. They want a heavy barrel, but then complain about the weight. They want a piston-driven gas system, but complain the gun is front heavy. They want a quick change barrel system, but then complain the rifle won't hold zero. Or that barrels in other calibers aren't available. But then let's face it, few people buy barrels in other calibers anyways. Because for the elevated conversion kit price, they can actually buy another rifle, like an AR-15. And why wouldn't you? They want an ambidextrous safety, but then complain that it interferes with their trigger finger. They want a 1 in 7 barrel twist rate, but then complain about poor accuracy with cheap surplus 55 grain ammunition. They want all this in a modular design, but then complain about the price. Simply put, this rifle represents an admirable effort by a manufacturer who is willing to give us everything consumers have been asking for. You can almost feel the selfless sacrifice that went into the design of this rifle, as we selfishly complain about the negatives that came at the cost of giving consumers exactly what they want what they asked for, and the rifle we're all looking at today, the Bushmaster ACR DMR. Thank you for watching, and I hope you stay tuned for part two of this series.